Good morning, good morning. Thank you for joining us for worship this morning. It is great to see you here on this holiday weekend. Thank you for joining us in worship. A couple of announcements before we get started. This Wednesday kicks off our uh, fall events on Wednesday nights for kids for kindergarten all the way through 12th grade. We start in the other building with some praise and worship all together and then break off into our separate groups. So I'm really excited for it and I hope that you can send your kids that way kindergarten through 12th grade. On the back table back there you can find this um, handout. It has information for what is it? Oh, it's in the pews. Sorry, it's in the pews. Uh, and it has information if you'd like to join the Bible studies that happen on Sunday morning. They're going to start next week. So if you want any information on that, you can fill these out. And if you just want to show up and join one on Sunday, you will be welcome to do so then. Uh, on S September 19th, two weeks from today, after both worships, we're going to have a short congregation meet, congregational meeting to uh, finish up some nominating committee stuff as we elect our new vice chair for this year. With that all being said, I invite you to stand and join me in call to worship. As followers of Christ, we are called to a life of service. May worship reorient our efforts back to that call. Redeemed by Christ, we are called to humility. May our prayers, praise, and stewardship reward us back to that call. May we continue to stand and sing our opening hymn.
Let's pray. God, we ask your blessing. We ask for the promise of your nearness and the reminder of your eternal love made known in Jesus Christ as we spend these moments together to worship you. We ask for your guidance for those things that we still struggle to know what to do with. And we pray for the strength to lay them before you in the moments that we share as we bring to you our earnest praise. Hear us now as we pray to you in one voice the words of your Son, Jesus. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As you're finding your seat, I invite the children forward for children's moment with me. Good morning, friends. Okay, tell me what you want to be when you grow up. You don't know yet? Do you know what you want to be when you grow up? A flight man in the Air Force. A flight man in the Air Force? What do you want to be? A doctor. A doctor? What do you want to be? Elementary school music teacher. An elementary school music teacher. What do you want to be when you grow up? A firefighter. A firefighter? Oh, yes. What do you want to be when you grow up? Do you know? What? <laughs> I don't think. <laughs> when I was your age and we had career day, I wanted to be, and I quote, a hair cutter. Yeah, when I was your age, I wanted to be a hair cutter. And then my, the lady that was cutting my hair told me that my, her feet hurt all the time, so I decided that I shouldn't be a hair cutter anymore. Um, so t- this weekend we're celebrating Labor Day, and we're talking about all the different gifts that people have. And they have all these different gifts so that even if you don't know what you want to be when you grow up, you can still find your gifts. You could be whatever you want and still help each other and serve each other and help us uh, have a great community that has all different gifts where you can be anything that you want. And sometimes you might mess up. Sometimes it might take you a couple of tries to find out what you want to do. But it's still great for you to find the gifts that God give, gave you so that you can uh, be whatever you want to be when you grow up. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for sending Jesus. Thank you for giving us the gifts to serve you and to serve others. Help us to make good decisions and follow you. Amen. Okay, you can go back to sit with your family. Here at First Christian Church, we are a community that prays together, prays for each other, and prays for the people around us. If you have any prayer requests, we ask that you can submit those at fccmckinney.org, and we can share that with pastors or a prayer team or elders that are here ready to pray for you and whoever is in your life. Let us go to God in prayer. Good and gracious God, From the very start of creation, you demonstrated days of work and days of rest. Your creation demonstrates that we are connected based on our labor and our gifts. We are connected because we are dependent on each other, dependent on the farmers, caretakers, and teachers, and so many more. We thank you for the gifts and the talents that allow us to earn a living and contribute to the world around us. We ask this morning that you sustain the people in this room and the people around us in your world. Sustain us, sustain us through grace, sustain us through your love. We lift up to you this morning those that have been working extra hard to keep peace and to keep us safe those who are working extra hard to rebuild, 
to rebuild communities and rebuild homes after natural disasters. This morning, bind us together in community. Bind us together so that we might find the love in a neighbor who we might also see as a stranger. We ask this, worshiping in many places, but praying to you, our one God. Amen. Good morning, y'all. It's good to be together. I'm glad you're here, whether you're worshiping uh, here in person or you're online joining in worship from wherever you happen to be right now. Good to be together. There's a whole lot of biblical writing and plenty of theological pondering and writing, wondering, that's kind of occupied with defining two things, our, our experience of God, kind of the things that we've come to believe about God, and then how we respond to that. What do we do with that stuff that we think and believe about God? It's this balancing act between faith, the things we believe, and works, the things that we do. And it's a tricky balancing act. When you read the Gospels, on one hand, you've got Jesus describing faith in the story of a parable that's like faith is a mustard seed. All it takes is this tiny, tiny little bit and it's enough. It's enough to grow and flourish and do incredible things. And so Jesus leans heavily on the idea of the faith that we hold. But if you go to the 25th chapter of Matthew's gospel, we get Jesus in what is the only account of judgment in the gospels, where Jesus places very clear emphasis on the work that we do. Asking the question, how did we tend to the poor and to the lonely and to the stranger, to those among us in need? So Jesus sort of straddles both sides of this conversation and sort of like, Jesus, which is it? Come on, man. Give, give us a clear answer. And all through the scriptures, we kind of see writers and storytellers kind of playing both sides of, of how do we strike this balance. In this morning's reading in the second chapter of the book of James, you're going to hear a pretty clear position on the matter. James chapter 2, we'll read the first 10 verses and then hop over to verse 14. My brothers and sisters, do you with your acts of favoritism really believe in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ? For if a person with gold rings and fine clothes comes into your assembly, and if a poor person in dirty clothes also comes in, and if you take notice of the one wearing fine clothes and say, have a seat here, please, while you say to the one who is poor, stand there, sit at my feet, have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers and sisters, has God not chosen the poor in this world to be rich in faith, to be heirs of the kingdom that he has promised to those who love him? But if you, dis you have dishonored the poor, it is, not the, is it not the rich who oppress you? Is it not they who drag you into court? Is it not they who blaspheme the excellent name that was invoked over you? You do well if you really fulfill the law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors, for those who keep the whole law but fails in one point has become accountable for all of it. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith but do not have works? Can faith save you? If a brother or sister is naked and lacks daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm, and eat your fill, yet you do not supply their bodily needs, what good is that? So faith by itself, if it has no works, is dead. Did you hear the sass? 
Did you hear the tone? There was, there was not much to be sort of uh, left to the imagination in this opening line of the second chapter of this letter here. James 2.1 in Peter's language. Are you telling me you really believe in Jesus? This book of James is attributed to James, who is the brother of Jesus. And the writer here, perhaps because of his own experience to the hands-on stuff, the work he saw of Jesus, what he knows to be true of Jesus, perhaps because of that, he leans heavily on the notion of actions and not faith alone as the basis of following Jesus. And, and he contributes to the same kind of wrestling match here in this letter that he writes, the wrestling match of figuring out how do we balance faith which is important, and works, which is important. The stuff that we believe about God and the actions and intentional conduct that we carry out in light of those beliefs. And the argument here is pretty explicit that he makes. There is no such thing, according to this writer, as faith without works. It doesn't exist. He calls it a dead faith. Later on in the second chapter, he goes on to, to make reference to the same sort of uh, idea uh, using the word barren, as though it were like empty or unproductive. And if you go back to that, that first verse, do you really believe in Jesus? What's interesting is that his beef, while it is with sort of the things that they're doing, with all of that sass, that beef he's got in that opening question, is rooted in his issue with their favoritism. Like how they're ranking and prioritizing people, the sort of space that they're willing to provide for some, but maybe not for others. Remember when you learned to drive? Maybe it was a long time ago. I've noticed this, this shift in learning to drive. Now, back in the day, if you drove around with your driver's ed instructor, their vehicle might have plastered on the side of it, student driver. But have you noticed the, the change? See, when I was a kid, the only way that you knew that you were out learning to drive is if you saw me behind the wheel and we came up to an intersection and you were across the intersection from me, you could gaze into the vehicle through the windshield of my mother's minivan and see my hands at 10 and 2 and my mother's left forearm across the inside of the vehicle that has left a permanent indentation in my chest and those of my siblings as well. That's how you knew somebody was driving. Was you could hear the screams from inside the vehicle of their parent who was riding along with them. But now every student driver... Even on mom's and dad's vehicles, they have these little placards, student driver. Yellow background, black print, makes it easy to see. Now, I don't know much about the world of student driving, but my guess is those placards on the sides of those family vehicles that say student driver is an intent to signal something to the rest of us. Clear the sidewalks. It's an intent to signal to the rest of us to be sure to create just a little more space. <laughs> Remain aware of the fact that whoever's behind the wheel of that car is still figuring it all out. That sign that is plastered there on the side of the car, student driver, is intended so that the rest of us on the road might extend a little bit more grace. Now let's talk about grace for a minute, shall we? Grace is the free and unearned love of God. That's what's going to be in the glossary in the back of your book. Grace is the free and unearned love of God. And it's super annoying. See, I, I want credit. I want credit for all of the very good things I do. I want credit for when I'm a patient parent. I listen to my children instead of, like, screaming back at them for screaming at me. I, I, I want credit for when I am a thoughtful and caring spouse. See, I'm off on Fridays, and after a long week of teaching kindergarten, I know that my wife will be happy when she comes home, and I have cleaned the house and put the dishes away, where she's shocked to learn that I knew we even owned a vacuum cleaner. 
Like, and I want credit for that. I want credit for the fact that I was a good spouse and I cleaned the house because I knew that she would be happy about it when she got home. I want credit for, for leaving the generous tip on the dinner bill because the server was responsible for too many tables because the coworker didn't show up, right? I want credit like, look at this guy, check this guy out, doing pretty good over here. And, and I want to make sure that others that I'm just a little bit put out with are held to account for all of the wrong, dumb, misguided things they've done. I want all the credit for the good that I've done, and at the same time, I really want to make sure that you over there with your political position that's different than mine, you understand that it is your guy that got us into XYZ mess, and you're the problem, and you need to be held to account for that. I want to make real sure that the person who cut me off in traffic who didn't have a sign on their side of their car gets to see some of my digits as I pass by, letting them know that they cut me off. I want to make real sure. Right, we want to have it both ways. I want all the credit for all the good things I've done. Take note, God, put it on my ledger. And at the same time, I want to make sure that everybody else is held to account for their misdeeds or missteps or mistakes or accidents or even their intentional wrongs. But grace won't let us do that. Grace, the unearned love of God that's freely given, won't let us do that. Grace means there's no amount of good that can make God love you more. And there's no amount of bad that can make God love you less. You are entirely powerless to reduce the amount of love that God has for you. And it's also true for people you don't like. And it's also true for people we can't stand. And it's true for people that don't look like you or vote like you or operate their families like you or are operate a line of work that you don't understand. And it's super annoying. But it's the fundamental nature of our faith in Jesus is that we don't earn God's love. God just gives it. There's a church in Denver, Colorado that every Thanksgiving operates this really cool program called uh, Operation Turkey Sandwich. And their intent is to be a blessing to people who are out working away from their families on Thanksgiving. And so they have these really great uh, brown bag lunches that they whip up. And it's a real, not like, a, not like the sliced deli turkey sandwich, but like the roasted turkey from the oven turkey sandwich. And a piece of pie and stuffing, and they put it all into the bag, and then these church folks deploy around their city and around their neighborhoods to hospitals and nursing homes for the, the caretakers who, who have to be there. They hit police stations and fire departments, right? They find city bus drivers who are out working the very limited service that happens to be open that day to be a blessing to folks who are stuck at work away from their families when the rest of us are enjoying a nice holiday. The pastor uh, tells the account that one year this also happened to include the person who had on their schedule to be at work at the adult bookstore. It was open. They were at work. And so they walked in the front door Handing lunch across the counter? Hi, we're from the church. And the person on the other side of the counter uh, found themselves a little, a little without words. It's not often that people walk into that establishment and announce, hi, we're from the church. Now, I don't make my living at an adult bookstore but I might as well. I, as your pastor, are no more or less a sinner saved by grace than any other person in any other line of work. And my, my W-2 that says where I got paid, that I turn into the feds at the end of the year, has zero bearing. Zero bearing on the grace of God, the unearned love of God that you can't get more of and can do nothing to diminish.
And, and yet we live so constantly inundated with like a filtering of people. But we live with this constant filtering of sort of who's like us and who's unlike us. And there's not a single division that we can draw. There's not a single dividing line or category that we can create that God's going to look at and go, oh, yeah, run with that. Good idea. But it sounds exhausting, doesn't it? It it puts us in very difficult positions. It's a lot of work. It's counterintuitive. It's not terribly popular. And our culture is not built for it. So here's your pro tip. Think of that student driver sign on the side of the car, right? The the one that is reminding us to extend grace and space to, to that person who's operating that vehicle, that sign on the side of the car that's supposed to remind us that they're still figuring it out. What sign do you wish people could see hanging around your neck? That might tell them why you need just a little space, a little grace, that might remind somebody that you're still figuring it out. Imagine if you looked at that person who bumped into you in the line at Kroger and they weren't paying attention and if they stopped staring at their phone and would just pay attention to the aisle, then they wouldn't be going bumping into people. Imagine that person turns around And across their chest on the sign around their neck says, my mother's in the hospital. I'm estranged from my daughter. Miscarriage, foreclosure, depression and anxiety that I haven't figured out how to deal with yet. Pre-existing conditions that scare me right now. A marriage that is just in pieces and I don't know how to put them back together. Imagine in the lives of other people some sign that could signal to us that it's our moment to create just a bit more space. To remain aware that they're still figuring it out. To extend grace. And it's from grace that both works and faith extend. It is from grace that we have formed our faith, our thought about God, and our works, the stuff that we do. Now, those works are not to earn God's favor, but to just dumbfoundedly celebrate the fact that we already have God's love. Nothing we did to get it, nothing we can do to get rid of it. And so our works are just like this dumbfounded act of gratitude to God. That God has been so generous and gracious with us that we just kind of have no choice but to be generous and gracious with one another. Even when it doesn't quite make sense. Creating space and acknowledging the sort of still figuring it all outness of life. And faith that, that is really rooted in this idea of grace. Faith that is brought to life in the person life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, that God loves us without exception. That's what we hold fast to, is what is revealed to us through Jesus. It's what we've said as Christians we have placed our faith in. Just the astounding love of God that is freely given. And it is yours, and it is ours, and it is is good. Amen. Friends, in a moment, we're going to celebrate the meal of communion. It's these tangible elements of the very being of Christ that is for us this binding covenant with God. It is for us this reminder of invitation to know that there is full life and eternal love in God. And so as we ready ourselves to again hear the promises of Christ at the table, I invite you to join your voices in song. I come with joy is hymn 420 in your hymnal and on the screen as well. Let's sing.
together. Jeremy, Father, we come this day so thankful that we're able to come to be able to, to walk away, to walk here, to be with you, dear Lord. The Lord, we're still struggling with trying to figure out in our lives how you conquered death and overcame it, how you did that for me, that in three days you were raised. Dear Lord, every day I walk and try to conquer this world, but dear Lord, I know that you are with me, that I can do this. I can do it because you gave your son for us. Dear Lord, we thank you for all the blessings, and we pray for this world and this land, even as small as it is, how significant, how important it is for us every day that we're able to walk and conquer the things that are in our way because you have blessed us with your son's love. Thank you for everything that you do for us in this world and land as we go through our lives today. In Christ's holy name. end of his life, Jesus took bread while he was eating in an upper room with his disciples. And from their table, he blessed that bread and gave thanks for it and broke it and passed it among those who were gathered with him and said to them, take and eat, for my body is broken. And in a very similar way, he took the cup, blessing it and giving thanks for it. He shared it with those who were with him inviting them to receive it, to drink it as his blood of a new covenant, body broken and blood shed for the forgiveness of sin and an invitation to know the eternal and very, very present love of God. Receive these gifts as a reminder of God's invitation to full life. In the same way that we acknowledge that our experience of God at the communion table makes us new into something perhaps that we weren't before, the gifts that we bring as an act of worship before God for the work of the church sort of draws on that same idea that God makes something ordinary into something new. God takes the gifts that we each bring and from their individual places gathers them into one, offering blessing upon them and using them for things that on our own we could never make possible. And so we see the resurrection and new creation story told in the generosity of each of us who bring our gifts, our tithes and offerings before God for the work of the church. If you're with us here in worship today, you're invited to make use of our offering trays at the back of the worship space as you make your way out. You can also conduct online giving at our website, fccmckinney.org. And we ask God's blessing upon these gifts that are given in faith and in faithfulness. To do so, let's rise and sing our doxology. in these moments of quiet and worship. 
You tell us to come to me, all of you who are weary and are carrying burdens, and I'll give you rest. We need to bring our gratitude for this rest, an eternal well of life, which gives us hope in our heart in rested souls. Our gifts are given from our hearts in a sharing, cheerful love, as you have shown us how to do. Take these gifts and bless them for your use as we bring them with joy and thanksgiving. We are so grateful that we can offer you what you have already given back to us. May the spirit inside each of us draw closer to you and rejoice in all our gifts to offer. May we be inclusive in all that we do for you and how we labor for you, Lord. We ask all these things in the name of Christ Jesus. Amen. Just around the corner from my neighborhood, and I'm not exaggerating, around the corner is a driving school, and they're in my neighborhood all the time, just driving as slow as they can. There's teenagers, just, just little turtles going through my neighborhood. And at first I thought it was fun because I would wave at them, and that's the driving school I took my driver's ed from, and I thought it was fun. And then after a couple weeks, that kind of got a little boring because um, I had things to do. Um, and so I say to you today, whether your journey is taking you some time, patience and being careful, or if you've got places to go, God is with you on that journey. And if you find yourself wanting to be a part of First Christian Church of McKinney, we're here to welcome you with open arms, and you're invited to contact one of the pastors to continue that conversation. Uh, let, us let us continue to stand and sing our closing hymn, Ours, the Journey. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the free and unearned love of God, be the banner under which we depart from this place of worship. Go in peace.
with the partnership and companionship of a God of love that you can't get rid of. Amen.